Well, good morning, church family. That little video introduces us to the fourth and final message in this series from the book of Deuteronomy. Take your Bibles and turn with me to Deuteronomy uh, chapter 1. As we're talking about the influence uh, that God's word is to have on our lives, that we are to have on the next generation, as that video shows, uh, this generation goes to uh, Google, goes to Siri, goes to YouTube for everything, but we know God has given us his timeless truth, and so we want to be grounded in that. Uh, and it's been fun uh, to walk through these four weeks with you. Uh, when I told some people we were doing Deuteronomy, I kind of got that look, like, really, Deuteronomy? Uh, but, man, your feedback has been amazing, and some of you have been like, I wish we were doing more in Deuteronomy, so I'll remember that for, for the future. Uh, but as we come to this text today, today is actually kind of a, a zoomed-out look uh, at the entire book of Deuteronomy, uh, as we're going to look at how Moses began uh, his message to the people there camped on the plains of Moab. Uh, as I've told you before, these are Moses' final words. These are the final sermons that God gave him to give to his people before they were about to pay, take this huge step of entering the promised land. And over the years, various people have documented the famous last words of many people. Uh, and so uh, we've got some of those on the screen for you today. Uh, Groucho Marx, the actor, a comedian, said, this is no way to live, right? His final words. Ben Franklin, famous Benjamin Franklin, one of the founding fathers of our country, a dying man can do nothing easy. Uh, was one of the things uh, that he said right before he passed. Uh, Mozart, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart said, I feel something that is not of this earth. So perceptive, right? That was definitely a guy who was in touch with his emotions. Then you've got Nostradamus, uh, the 16th century guy who liked to predict things. He was a prognosticator. He predicted tomorrow, I shall no longer be here. And that is one of his predictions that we know came true. Uh, as that happened definitively. Uh, and then last but certainly not least, uh, the Mexican revolutionary general Pancho Villa famously said, don't let it in like this. Tell them I said something. And his biography, biographer wrote down, don't tell the, let it in like this. Tell them I said something. Not probably what he intended, but yet his last words nonetheless. And so we have Moses' final words in the book of Deuteronomy. Those words that God gave this incredible leader. Uh, to give to his people. Moses didn't have to go searching for something to say at the end of his life. Instead, he knew what to point God's people to. It was his word. It was his truth. It was to tell the story of what God had done. It was to, to teach and impress God's truths and his laws upon his people. And it was to teach them to trust God's plan for the future as well. We're going to look at those movements, which really comprise the whole book of Deuteronomy. So buckle up today. Stand with me in honor of God's word as we read from Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. The Lord our God spoke to us at Horeb. You've stayed at this mountain long enough. Resume your journey and go to the hill country of the Amorites and their neighbors in the Arabah, the hill country, the Judean foothills, the Negev, and the seacoast, to the land of the Canaanites and to Lebanon as far as the great river, the Euphrates River. See, I have set the land before you. Enter. And take possession of the land the Lord swore to give to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and their future descendants. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Pray with me this morning. Lord Jesus, that word resume is exactly what many of us need to do today. We've hit pause. We sit in disobedience. Our desire is for things other than to tell your story, to teach your word, to trust your plan. So today, God, would we, all of us in this room, take that next step that you have for us in our journey of faith. God, find us faithful just as Moses was faithful to give your word to a coming generation. We love you, Lord Jesus, and it's in your name we pray these things. And all God's people said, amen. You may be seated this morning. And so sometimes when you come to an Old Testament book like Deuteronomy, one of those books that has a lot of the Old Testament laws, has a lot of details, you have to do a little work to figure out context. What did it mean to that original audience? Because that world for a bunch of dusty Israelites who've been wandering through the desert is so different from ours. Sometimes we can ask that question, right? Are these truths relevant? And then you begin to lean in to what Moses was doing in this moment. How do we remain faithful as God's people in such a broken world? 
One of the things I love about that song we just sang, right? Do we feel the world is broken? And we declare, we do. We feel it. We feel it all around us, right? So how do we live faithfully? How do we show compassion to people and love to people and yet stand on our convictions? How do we make sure that we are living in the world but not of the world, as Jesus famously put it in John chapter 17? How do we avoid compromise when there are so many different choices, it seems like, that we have to make every given day? And how do we prepare our children and our grandchildren to live faithfully in a world that's going to be far different uh, than the world that you and I grew up in? I love that Paul, as someone with a Jewish background who knew these words of the Old Testament inside and out, right? He wrote to the Corinthians after talking about these passages of the Old Testament. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11, he says, These things happen. These things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our instruction. I want to remind you of that. But just as we looked at last week from the beginning of chapter 5, where Moses says, these laws weren't just given to your fathers, right? They were given to you. That God's word is truthful in every generation. That God's word has something to say to you and it has something to say to me. And so as one famous philosopher, a guy by the name of George Santanaya said, he said, those who cannot remember the past are doomed to repeat it. And so God wants us to know. He wants us to know his story. He wants us to know his truth. He wants us to know his promises. And that's what we're going to look at today. So I'm not joking. I'm going to preach the whole book of Deuteronomy to you. Are you ready? All right. Deuteronomy teaches us to, number one, tell the story. That's the first four chapters of the book of Deuteronomy. Is It's Moses retelling the story. One of the great things about the Bible is, is God knows that our hearts are wired to listen to and to receive stories. It's something that happened often in my house. I learned our family history by listening to my dad and my uncles and my grandfather sit around the big dining room table and tell stories about our family. It's how we learn things. We learn by story. So much of the Bible is told to us in story. And so I find it fascinating that one of the first things Moses does is he tells the people, he retells the story of the nation of Israel. Look with me at Deuteronomy 1.1 where it says, These are the words that Moses spoke to all Israel. All Israel. What Moses is going to do is he's going to basically preach what we would call today an expository sermon. He's going to break down the history of Israel, the laws of Israel, the promises of God for Israel, and he's going to explain them. Now, the best definition for all my seminary classes and all my books on preaching that I've ever heard of expository preaching came from one of our young adults at our Tuesday night service. We call it Kairos up at the Brentwood campus. One of these young men Right, new to the church, came up to our senior pastor and said, man, keep doing what you're doing. He goes, what do you mean? He goes, I, I need you to read the Bible, explain what it means, and tell me how to do it. Right? That's it. That's expository preaching. That's what we want to do. It's what every faithful preacher should do. Right? Read the word, explain it, and then here's the important part. Right? Tell us how to live it. And that's what Moses is doing in these words and in these passages. It's interesting to me that it says at the beginning of verse 2, it is an 11-day journey from Horeb, that's another name for Mount Sinai, where the Ten Commandments were given, to Kadesh Barnea, which is right there entering the Promised Land, the gateway to the Promised Land by the way of Mount Seir. Now look in verse 3, in the 40th year, Moses began to teach. Do you realize that it only takes 11 days to hike from Mount Sinai to the Promised Land? But how long did it take God's people to get there? 40 years. Why? Because of their disobedience. Because they refused to believe. We'll retell the story in just a moment. But the reality is, is that our God, Deuteronomy, right? The second law, repetition, right? God gives us second chances and praise God that he does. But he also doesn't remove the cost of our disobedience. And an entire generation had to die in the wilderness, right? Before God would move his promises on. Now God's going to fulfill his word. He's going to keep his promises. But you and I, it's our calling to be faithful and obey. So I want you to think about that today as we work through this text, right? In the book of Deuteronomy, 11 days or 40 years. We get to make that choice. And I love verse 3, where it says at the back half of verse 3, Moses told the Israelites, everything the Lord had commanded him to say to them. He told them everything. He told them the hard truths. He told them the things that probably didn't make logical sense to him. But Moses was faithful. 
parents, grandparents, friends, neighbors, brothers, sisters, we have a responsibility to teach the next generation everything God says. The whole counsel of God. It's not our job to tickle their ears. It's not our job to make them feel comfortable. It's not our job to make them feel politically correct. It is our job to be sure they know the whole counsel of Scripture. As I told you last week, they need to know the why. Part of the myth today is there's a lot of churches and Christians who are tempted to water down the Word of God in order to make it more appeasing to the masses. That's not what the masses are looking for. Instead, they're looking for something to build their life on because they intuitively know what they piecemealed together, their philosophy of life isn't working. It's not deep enough. It doesn't deal with life's deepest, deepest problems. Only, only our belief can do that. And so we have a responsibility, right, to teach everything, to be like Moses. As I told you last week, people who go deep into God's word and then bring it back to the people. And so I love that God always holds us responsible for being faithful. The results are always up to him. So Moses is saying, this is the way it is. These are the words that God gave me to guide, to, to guide and direct you. And so one of the things that's fascinating to me about this passage in verse 5 is it says, across the Jordan in the land of Moab, Moses began to explain this law by saying, and he spends the next four chapters retelling the history of Israel. If he's going to explain the law, notice how he sets it in the storyline of redemption. Notice how he tells them the story first. So as I talked about last week, there's this narrative in modern Christianity where we go, law bad, grace good, right? Well, as I told you last week, grace, God's deliverance from slavery came before law. The law is a form of God's grace, so God's people know how to live, right? And leading us to the grace of Jesus Christ, the only one who can save us, the only one who could fulfill the law perfectly. So it's all grace. It's all the narratives of God's grace. And you'll remember that famously A.T. Pearson, I quote this often, the Baptist preacher said, history is his story. It's God's story of what he has been doing throughout the ages and the generations. And so the first thing that Moses does is he recounts the story of Israel in the book of Deuteronomy. That's what these first four chapters are all about. So they leave Mount Sinai. Right, they march up to, to Kadesh Barnea. They're right there on the doorstep of the promised land. And here is their first faith failure. As they look and peer over into the promised land, they decide to appoint a committee. Right? It's the first sign that things are going to go wrong. Okay? Now, know this. I was born battered, buttered, and bruised Southern Baptist. My church had committee after committee growing up. My dad was actually the chairman of a committee on committees at one time, right? Right? We had to have a committee in order to fulfill all of the roles on committees. Some of you are nodding because you know what I'm saying, okay? Now, to be clear, I think wise counsel is important. I think accountability in a church is important. But sometimes when God has given us his word, we will do things like create committees, right? Or we'll kick the can down the road in different ways to avoid being obedient to his word. What had God already told the people? The land is good. Go enter it and possess it. So what does Israel do? Well, they're like, let's get together a group of spies, right? Let's get together a committee. And so they do. They go check out the promised land. They come back. First part of their report, the land is good. It's flowing with milk and honey, right? And the people are like, cool. And I'm like reading the text, but God already told you that. How many times, brothers and sisters, are we guilty of telling God things he already knows? And we think that's our great act of faith, right? God knows, and he told you to enter and possess the land. But part two of the report is just that. Uh, we can't do it. Have you seen the size of people living in that land? I mean, they're like the Nephilim. They're giants. There's no way we can defeat them. Every time I use that word, right, these giants, I think of the guys I hired on my student ministry team. I was able to hire Aaron Bryant, who played professional football. He's now our Avenue South pastor. I hired Link Taylor, who's like six foot four and was the center for McGavick High School. I hired Chris Blanton, right, because here was my, my thought process. If nothing else, I hire these great big guys. And even if they're terrible ministers, they can sit on teenagers and make them behave, right? <laughs> Camp, mission trips, all these places we're going to be. See my strategy there? 
Well, by God's grace, they were not only huge men, but they were also very gifted ministers who are all still with our church family today. But I called them my Nephilim, right? Because I'm not a small guy, but when I walk around with them, right, there's these giants in the land uh, among me. And that's what the people saw. Big guys are intimidating. And so they come back. And instead of stepping forward in faith, their fear overcomes them. And God says, this is not going to be good for you. And so what happens? The people throw up a false repentance. Oh, God, we're sorry. No, we'll, we'll, we'll take possession of the land. Matter of fact, we'll go out and fight right now. They do, and the Lord says, I'm not with you because you've been disobedient. They are routed, defeated. And so instead of 11 days, they spend what? The next 40 years wandering in the wilderness, learning the hard way how to apply God's word when they have to trust him every day for manna to fall from heaven, when they have to trust him for keeping a million people alive in the wilderness. I've hiked part of the Sinai wilderness. It's like the moon. There's not a blade of grass. There there is nothing hospitable about that climate whatsoever. And I can't imagine a million people in the wilderness trying to get along in that heat, trying to, to depend on one another, trying to learn God's word. And so God's word is going to be accomplished one way or the other. But are you going to do it your way or God's way? Israel tried their way. And Moses didn't want the people to forget it. But he also did not want them to forget God's promises. So he told them, the season of discipline, right, will come to an end. When that generation has been gathered to your fathers, right, then I will give you the promised land. And so Moses roots God's people in helping them find their place in the story. The past with God is never dead, right? It is the beginning of the future. It explains the why. It's why I love history, because it explains the why, how we got to where we're at. And if you unravel it, if you go back, In particular, if you go back in biblical history, you will see the patterns and the hand of God's grace at work. It is the beginning of the future. And if we don't know what God's plan is, then we don't know our place in it. You see so many people in this generation trying to figure it out. What's my place in this world? What am I here for? What am I living for? And what our world tempts and teaches us is that you are the middle of the story, that you are the center of the universe, that it's all about you. Let me give you a hint. It's not. God is the hero of the story. Jesus is at the center of it all, holding all things together. The Spirit is the one who works in and through us. It's not about us. Now, that's good news. Because I'm not big enough to hold the universe together, but God is. And so I live best when I live for him, when I find my place, when I step into the story. And so for the Israelites, they needed to know their place in the story. Your parents, right? they they had a faith failure. And so they don't get to see the promised land. But you, God is going to keep his promises through you. So keep his word. They needed to know that as they were about to take their step into their future. For you and I today, we live between the first and the second coming of Jesus Christ. Translation, despite all of the negativity and darkness of the world around us, we know that Jesus has already won on the cross. We know that sin has already been defeated in his death and in his resurrection. Now we are waiting for the consummation, right, for the final trumpet to sound and for Christ to return. But that means that you and I, our children and our grandchildren, need to know where we're at in the story. We live between the already and the not yet. And so we have the opportunity to tell people, hey, this broken world isn't all there is. There's a king who came and he's coming again. We need to find our place in God's great big story. And we do that by telling it over and over again. Because when we forget our high calling as God's people, that's when we descend into low living. One of the things that inspired me most is I spent a week with our missionaries, our global workers in London with some of the one-on-one conversations I had with them. One of the most moving moments of our time together was out of our church family, our Brentwood Baptist church family, we commissioned three young men in their 20s to go to the nations with the gospel of Jesus Christ. One of those young men I had a lengthy conversation with one night. He's a trauma nurse. He's very gifted. He's very talented. He's energetic. He's enthusiastic. He is an incredible young man. 
And he is signing up to go with one of the most difficult mission organizations in the world that goes into hard, hard places where you have to be armed, where they are taking relief to, to people who won't get in any way, who won't eat any other way. And they go in the name of Jesus into places where they will be killed for going in the name of Jesus. And when I asked him, I said, man, you have it all going for you. Why would you do this? Here's, he looked me dead in the eye and said, why would I not? I only have one life to give and I'm going to give it for my Savior. Like he knows his place in the story and he's focused on it. And it is incredible to see. So Deuteronomy teaches us to tell the story so that we will know our place in it. Number two, Deuteronomy teaches us to teach the word, that we need to teach the word. Verse six, the Lord our God spoke to us at Horeb, that Sinai, you have stayed at this mountain long enough. Now, if you go back to Exodus and Numbers and you put it all together, one of the things you'll realize is that God's people spent a year after receiving the Ten Commandments. In our mind's eye, we have the, like the Charlton Heston Ten Commandments in our mind, you know. You get the Ten Commandments, right, and off we go, move in the big caravan. Not so. God's people needed to learn to worship him first. And so Moses needed to unpack the law, explain it to the people. They need to have time to set up the tabernacle. Have you ever read the end of Exodus? There's a whole bunch of details in there. And they matter. Why? Because our God is a God of order. And our worship matters to him. They needed time to set up the priests and the Levites, right? All of these things that would anchor God's people in worship. And so they spent nearly a year doing that. And then, I want you to underline or highlight this word, God said, resume. God said, resume. Now they're going to pick up what we would call real life seminary. <laughs> I have mentors who talk about the fact that so many young guys called to preach, they go to seminary, right? They, they learn a bunch of stuff. They have this real idealized view of what ministry is. And so they, they step into ministry and they discover it's very different from what you thought it would be like. I read an article recently that talked about the fact that a lot of people think that seminary is like culinary school. You learn the basics of doctrine and the Bible. You learn a few cool party tricks, and you are able to prepare a gourmet meal, right? Uh, at least one of them at the end of your time in seminary. But they said pastoring is more like waking up to the TV show Chopped. You get random ingredients thrown at you every day. You're expected to do something with whatever you're given while everyone watches and critiques, and occasionally something explodes, right? That's the way that real life is. And so for 38 years in the wilderness, right after the year coming out of Egypt, the year on the mountain, for 38 years, God's people had to learn to apply God's word in the wilderness. And so the book of Deuteronomy from chapter 5 forward, as we looked at last week, is about Moses giving God's people his truth, his word. It's almost as if Moses is saying, all right, guys, let's go over all of this again. Any parents, grandparents in the room, right? Ever had to repeat yourself to your children or your grandchildren? Yeah, we've got a little experiment going on in our house right now. We have these stools at our breakfast bar. My kids somehow forget to push them back in every time. So we have repeated dozens, if not hundreds of times, push the stool in, push the stool in, push the stool in. Guess what? This week the stools disappeared. We're going to learn, right? 11, year, 11 days, 38 years. We're going to learn our way, right, or the hard way. Like, you've got to be able to figure it out. Flush the toilet, turn off the lights, right? All of these things we don't say because we want to be legalists. We say because it's going to stink if you don't flush the toilet. If you don't turn off the lights, right, we're not going to have money. All of these things we have to repeat over and over again. And that's what Moses is graciously doing in the book of Deuteronomy. Follow me, I'm going to move fast. Last week, chapter 5, the Ten Commandments. Let's start there, right? We started with the Ten Commandments. A couple weeks ago, we looked at chapter 6, the Shema. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This must be upon your heart. Impress this upon your children to the next generation. Following Yahweh is a way of life. The next chapter is all the way through 11. Blessing and cursing. Let me give you the shorthand. Blessing, following God in his ways. Cursing, if you don't. Pretty simple, difficult to do, however. Chapter 4 was the ceremonial laws. Chapter 5, the festivals, so that the people would know and remember God and his ways. And then chapters 15 and 16 are the civil laws. How are we going to get along as God's people in the wilderness? 
pretty amazing to me that in those 10 chapters, chapter 16 through 26, we get what will regulate a nation of a million people in the wilderness. Because let's be honest, all of us think anarchy would be a lot of fun for a minute, don't we? Hey, no rules. I'm going to do what I want to get to do, right? As my high school buddies, anarchy, yeah, right? Anarchy's great until the guy beside you wants to do something that you don't want him to do. Then guess what? It's terrible. You see, if we follow our own way, we are under the tyranny of the most selfish, loudest, most brash voice around us. But instead, God in his grace said, hey, here are the laws that are going to keep us together as a people. Here are the rules that are going to keep us safe. Here's going to be what we follow so we don't get diseased, so we don't get sick in the wilderness. Because guess what? There's no hospitals in the middle of the desert. All of these things are there for a reason. And so when we read God's word, all of a sudden we realize what a gift it is. As we'll look at in the next series, we know that God's word, it's sufficient. God's word is clear. God's word is authoritative. And God's word is necessary for us to thrive and flourish. As we talked about last week, his commands are not a burden. They are a blessing because they enable us to live the way he designed and created us to live. A.W. Tozer put it this way. He said, most Christians don't listen to God's voice in Scripture because they've already decided they're not going to do what it says. It's convicting. As a pastor, I hear all the time, God never speaks to me. I never hear God's voice. Guess what? You have 66 books that give you God's voice. God speaks. He's still speaking today. These words as relevant now as they were when they were first given. So I want to, I want to be clear, right? When Moses was preparing God's people to conquer the promised land, he did not entertain them. He didn't send them home laughing. He didn't fill their bellies with the finest food, right? So they would really like him as a leader. He didn't even outfit and equip them with shields and spears and things and teach them how to fight militarily. Moses gave them the most important thing that he could. He gave them God's word. And there are a lot of things that we can give to others, but nothing is as important as God's truth because everything that matters flows from it. And so teach the word. That takes us all the way through Deuteronomy chapter 26 to number three, trust God's plan. Do you see it? Past, present, future, God's through it all. Here's what God has done. Here's God's word for you to live out. And here is what God is going to do. He can be trusted. I told you to underline this word in verse 7, resume, because that word is important. It means to break camp. It means to get moving. Because here's the way some of us are. We sit in our seats. We sit in our Bible studies. We love, right, Bible study. What we have a hard time with is Bible living. And so sometimes God has to move his people forward. We get really comfortable. We sit in our comfort zone, right? And we know a lot of facts, but we don't get them to work in our lives. And so God's people had been on the mountain at Sinai for a year, right? Learning how to worship, learning all the things. It's reminiscent to me of a story in the New Testament where Peter, James, and John get to go up the mountain with Jesus. The transfiguration takes place. They get a glimpse of Jesus' true glory. And Peter's like, Jesus, this is awesome. Let's camp out here and hang out here forever. Some of you have had mountaintop experiences in your faith on a mission trip, at a youth camp, at vacation Bible school. And man, when you go back there, you're like, man, if I could just go back there, right, and just live there, that would be awesome. That would be life. But what did Jesus model? Guys, we've got to go back down the mountain. The other disciples were struggling with a man who had a child who was in bad shape. And the Pharisees were there yelling at him, right, and the disciples were trying to figure it out. And Jesus knew the ministry was back down the mountain. And until he returns, that's your calling. That's my calling. Yeah, there are times when we get focused on God, but that's not just for ourselves. It's so that we can bless others. And so Jesus led them back down the mountain. Moses had to lead the people right out of Sinai. I love what one man, he's a, a minister with a ministry called Operation Mobilization. His name's George Werner. He said this. He said, some people are waiting for a call. What they need is not a call. They've already received that. They need a swift kick in the pants, right? And sometimes we do. We need God to push us out of our comfort zone. There are a lot of you who need to resume. I love that word that Moses uses that because he's saying it's time to break camp. It's time to move again. 
It's time to take the next step. All right, we've been here long enough. You know enough. It's kind of like getting married, having kids, right? We never feel like we know enough. We have enough money in the bank account to do any of those things in life. And yet there comes a point where it's like, all right, we got to take that step. We've got to commit to this relationship. It's time to start the family, right? It's time to make the move. Whatever it is, we got to go. And that's the moment it was for Israel. And so God had to push him out of the nest a little bit. And notice where he pushed him to. There's all of these geographical markers in this passage. Let me tell you why that's important. Because that's the same language that's used in Genesis chapter 15 and the promise made to Abraham. You see, as they step out of Sinai, they are stepping towards God's great big plan. His plan was to do what? Give Abraham's descendants, make them into a nation and give them a land that they would be a people belonging to him, that they would be a light to the nations. Now, we know that Israel struggled to fulfill that, right, and couldn't fulfill it perfectly until Jesus. But that was the plan. It wasn't just about physical geography. It was about what we call the geography of grace, that God never forgot his promises to his people, and he was going to fulfill them one way or another. We can trust God's plan. Why? Because he's not forgotten a bit of it. And in verse 8, it says this, See, I have set the land before you. Some translations like the NIV will use the word given, right? I have given the land to you to enter and possess. And brothers and sisters, this is gospel. So I need you to listen to me carefully here. One of the tragedies to me is, is that God offers the gift of salvation to all today. He sets it before us. Romans 6, 23, right? The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. The promised land was right there in front of Israel for their taking with the Lord's help because of the Lord's provision for them. In the same way, the price for our salvation has been paid by Jesus Christ, and yet so many people approach the gift, the gift of salvation, it's set before them, and they're like, "Uh, I'll do it my way. No, thank you. I'm going to figure it out on my own. And they reject the gift that cost Jesus his life. Took Israel how long to figure it out? 40 years. 40 years before they'd have a second chance. God gives second chances. But today might be yours. God's offering you the gift of salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. We're saved only by faith alone, through grace alone, and Christ alone. Today is the day of salvation. Don't reject it. Don't turn away from it. Instead, possess it. Make it your own. God has offered it to you. Trust that his plan is the plan to follow. Trust that his way is the way for you to go. I love what Peter says about this in 2 Peter chapter 1. He says, by these he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may share in the divine nature. His very great and precious promises. The promises of God himself have been offered to you. Because here is the the follow, the sequel, right, to Deuteronomy. Joshua, where the people invade the land and possess it. But the sad reality is they were not completely obedient to his word. And they did not drive out all of the pagan cultures. And so those cultures begin to affect them. And the book of Judges is one of the saddest, darkest books in the Bible. Because it says, in that generation grew up a generation who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. So this generation, the Joshua generation, failed to disciple their children. And when they did, they knew neither the Lord nor his word nor his plan. And so it says they were unable to resist the cultures all around them. What's happening in our churches today? What's happening to a generation today? There's a remnant that God's raising up, but many are falling by the wayside. Why? They know neither the Lord nor what he has done. And the book of Judges ends on this super sad note. It says, in those days there was no king in Israel, so everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Sound familiar? Sound like our culture? And you tell me the book of Deuteronomy is for the dustbin of history. It's as relevant today as it's ever been. 
Because if we don't follow God and his word, if we don't trust his plan, right, that's the place that we end up. So let's talk about some practical handles. What do we do? How do we live Deuteronomy in 2022? Well, number one, here's the first thing you do. You live intentionally. You have influence. We've talked about it all throughout this series. Your kids and your grandkids, they're learning from you. Your neighbors and your coworkers and your fellow students, they're learning from you. The words that come out of your mouth, the activities that you prioritize, uh, whatever you watch on television, right? Wherever you spend your money, your children and grandchildren are watching. You have massive influence. As we talked about in Deuteronomy chapter 6, right? This word in verse 10, repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. All of life is a time to orient our hearts towards what it means to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. So we need to take a step today. Back in 2020, we were preaching through our spiritual challenge questions. I posed the question, all of us did across our eight campuses, who are you discipling and who is discipling you? Challenged you guys to answer that question. Well, there's a lady in our church, her, her name is Barbara Betts. Barbara has children, grandchildren. Barbara was married to a Baptist minister. She's now a widow. She wrote an incredibly compelling book about their journey with cancer and the struggle, but how God was faithful through it all. So Barbara's roots run deep. Unknown to me, right, Barbara took that message to heart, and she said, Here who's God, here's who God is calling me to disciple, my grandchildren. And so she began to write out devotionals. Her grandchildren were in college, so she's not around them. So she would email a simple two-page devotional to them every Sunday night and then ask them, how do I pray for you this week? She began with one week, right? Just took one step. Here's where I'm going to start. Well, I have right here a notebook of 45 Bible studies, right, that Barbara sent her grandchildren over that year to disciple them from afar, right? This was Barbara's way of saying, I'm going to live intentionally. I'm going to teach my grandchildren what God has taught me, and I'm going to do it in a way that engages them. Now, this is Barbara's way. You may not do it Barbara's way, right? But you may have your way. But the important principle here is she was intentional, and we can all be intentional as we take these steps to communicate our faith to the next generation. How do we live Deuteronomy in 2022? Number two, we recognize that our direction determines our destination. Our direction determines our destination. At some point, we got to get up off the couch, right? We have to point our feet in a direction, and we have to start walking. That's why I said that word resume is so important. Because there's a lot of you today, right, for whatever reason, your faith has been on pause. Maybe it's COVID and the pandemic, and you got out of the rhythms and habits you'd been in before. Maybe it's fear. Maybe it's life circumstances. Whatever it is. You've been on pause. Hear the word of the Lord today. Resume. Take a step. Don't keep wishing. Don't keep wondering. I hear that as a pastor all the time. I wonder what would happen if I got serious about my faith, right? I really wish, pastor, I could be more intentional. Stop wishing and wondering and start walking. Take a step. And then when you take that step, God will show you the next step. That's the cool thing about faith. God never shows us the whole picture. He shows us enough that we can trust him. But the whole picture would blow our mind. If you would have told me I was recounting the story of how I became pastor of this church the other day to someone, I never could have orchestrated it or designed it. You guys are an amazing congregation. And I'm blessed to get to shepherd you and lead you. I couldn't have planned this. My life depended on it. But God would show me a step. I would clumsily, right, try to take that step, right? Learn some things. He'd show me the next step. And here we are. And God has worked through you in a powerful way. And it's a privilege to, to lead and guide you guys. But the reality is, is right, the steps that we take determine our destination. You can sit around all day long and have good intentions. But until you start walking, you will never get there. So take that first step. Write that first devotional. Send that text message. Do whatever it is that you need to do. Because our third takeaway today is this. Wherever you're at is a good place to start. Wherever you're at today is a good place to start. Hear the word of the Lord, right? And get walking. I love that towards the end of this passage, Moses sums this up so beautifully. Towards the end of his teaching in Deuteronomy chapter 30, he says, I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Choose life so that you may live, you and your descendants. Love the Lord your God, obey him and remain faithful to him, for he is your life. 
And he will prolong your days as you live in the land the Lord swore to give to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. His very great and precious promises. The good news is, is just like the people who received this on the plains of Moab. God says, let's go. Today is the day. Take that step past the promise. Bow your head with me as we come to this time of response. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the life-giving words of Deuteronomy. That in this passage, we see you again recounting and telling your story for our good. So that we and our children and our grandchildren can know their place in the story. God, thank you for teaching us your word. That your laws, your precepts, your truths, God, they are not bland legalism. Instead, they were designed to give your people life. To show us how to flourish. To show us how to live for you, not eccentrically, but instead loving you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. God, thank you that we can trust your promises, that they are very great and precious, and we can know and believe that you are always at work keeping your word. For some of us, it's 11 days. We want to see and respond. For some of us, it takes a little longer like you did the nation of Israel. But by your grace and mercy, you give us the chance to resume, to start again, to break camp, to be pushed out of that nest. God, to take that step of faith, trusting that you've got the whole world in your hands. So Lord Jesus, today, may we believe and trust in your promises. May we pass those promises to a new generation knowing that it's the very most important thing we could do for them. So find us faithful to you, just as Moses was faithful in his generation. And we love you, Lord Jesus, and it's in your name we pray these things. And all God's people said...